We're pleased that you've tuned into this sermon. It's part of a larger worship experience here at the church. And our prayer is that as you listen, God has a word for you. Our scripture lesson this morning comes unsurprisingly from uh, Mark's gospel and his account of the triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem. This is what we commemorate each and every year on Palm Sunday. And in each of the four gospels, we have a rendering of the story. And it really is quite a dramatic scene that Mark is going to paint for us, that uh, Jesus was welcomed during the great festival of of Passover into Jerusalem and hailed as a, as a messianic figure, if not the Messiah, uh, the one through whom God was going to act in order to heal and restore not only uh, the Jewish people, but all people. It's really a remarkable, remarkable event. And yet, many have suggested over the years that perhaps uh, Jesus wasn't really intending for this to happen. There are some who believe that Jesus was simply going with his disciples into Jerusalem to celebrate Passover along with thousands and thousands of other people. He was recognized as this teacher and miracle worker. He had quite the reputation. And that kind of a spontaneous uh, demonstration broke out. The nationalistic feelings were running high at Passover as they did every year. People were hopeful about their future and what God could do to restore their fortunes. And uh, that maybe Jesus just kind of got caught up in this and was carried along by the enthusiasm, uh, but that he really didn't intend for this to happen. And yet, as we read the story that Mark has for us today, in fact, in all of the Gospels, uh, I invite you to pay attention to how intentionally and methodically Jesus set this all up. This was really no accident. So from Mark, the 11th chapter verses 1 through 11, our scripture lesson for this morning. Now when they were approaching Jerusalem at Bethphage and Bethany near the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples and said to them, go into the village ahead of you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find tied there a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it. And if anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Just say this, the Lord needs it, and we'll send it back here immediately. Now they went away and found a colt tied near a door outside the street. And as they were untying it, some of the bystanders said to them, What are you doing untying that colt? But they told them what Jesus had said, and they allowed them to take it. And then they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it, and he sat on it. And many people spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut in the fields. And then those who went ahead and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. And then Jesus entered Jerusalem and he went into the temple. And when he had looked around at everything, as it was already quite late, he went back out to Bethany with the twelve. This last week on Wednesday, we celebrated World Happiness Day. Oh, what was a pleasant celebration for you? <laughs> How many had an opportunity to celebrate World Happiness Day? Anybody? Okay, we got one <laughs> hand up. Okay, so it's not quite the Hallmark Day just yet. But I think it's got some potential, right? World Happy. We could all use a little more of that, right? And uh, on World Happiness Day every year, the Gallup organization uh, let's loose its uh, World Happiness Report. And I know many of you have seen this referenced in the news. It's gotten quite a bit of, of attention this year. The World Happiness Report. And they survey thousands upon thousands of people all over the face of the planet, 144 different countries, and they try to measure the level of happiness in each country and then rank them. And happiness, I think we can all agree, is kind of a difficult thing to measure because there are no set uh, data or metrics that you can point to which are going to indicate a person's level of happiness because happiness is an emotional state, right? So you have to measure it by other means. Uh, When people are happy, they tend to report 
or feel or experience high levels of contentment and fulfillment and satisfaction and even joy. And when people are unhappy, they tend to use other words, not so pleasant words. And so, of course, the big news this last week, if you uh, were exposed to it on media, is that uh, the United States had a dramatic shift in its ranking in the World Happiness Index. Did we go up or did we go down? That's right. We went down really rather significantly. And uh, there are a lot of reasons for this. Uh, One dominant reason is that uh, we didn't slide in our happiness so much as we were just outpaced by other nations that are becoming more happy. (laughs) So that's a piece. And then another point is that young people particularly have a significant erosion in their level of happiness. Did you know that? I mean, that's worth paying attention to. Younger people, particularly in our country, are reporting increasing levels of unhappiness. And I read the report. It's about 130 pages, but it's a quick read. And they... (laughs) I know, I know. It's all in the service of a sermon, though. (laughs) It has nice pictures in it, so... But in that report, there's really some interesting speculation as to why uh, we are losing ground when it comes to happiness here in the United States. The number one thing they point to is the rising levels of isolation here in the United States. So we are increasingly isolated. I know that's hard to imagine here this morning (laughs) where we are sitting, you know, next to each other and uh, we're we're very much in community together, but uh, people are experiencing dramatically rising levels of isolation and they don't have ways to, in community, productively contribute to the betterment of society. And so that contributes This has all been pretty well studied, apparently, two levels of unhappiness. And then there's also the constant exposure to negative information. Amen? Constant exposure to negative information. There's uh, anxiety over the environment, over the economy. Uh, There's a level of political discord that is just tearing at us constantly. Uh, We are uh, increasingly sort of set against each other in our country. Uh, rather than finding ways to work productively in order to meet the challenges that we know we face, and it kind of goes on from there. So for those reasons, we, we slid out of the top 20 for the very first time. And uh, that means that many of us now can perhaps identify with Lamentations 3.17. My soul is bereft of peace. I have forgotten what happiness is. Now, if you're here this morning and you're feeling unhappy or you're feeling you should be happier than you are, it's okay. Just know that you're surrounded by other people who might be feeling the same way, and we will, uh, we will get through this. There is a path for us. As I was reading the report, though, and particularly as I started studying our passage for this morning, I was really struck by how happy the crowd was. I mean, that really got my attention. Maybe it was just after reading 130 pages of how unhappy everyone is, I noticed, wow, this crowd, these people are super happy. Why are they so happy? And I think the the simplest explanation might be, as some have put forward, the simplest answer might be that they were celebrating the Jewish festival of Passover, which was a really happy time for the Jewish people in the day of Jesus. It still is. It's difficult for we Christians to understand, but I think the best kind of correlation we could make is imagine if Christmas, Easter, New Year's, and your birthday all happened on the same day. That was Passover. Because that was the time when the Jewish people celebrated the great event of God's deliverance through the prophet Moses of the Hebrew people in bondage and slavery in Egypt. And it was a party. I mean, the city of Jerusalem swelled to several times its normal size. Everyone was there. Families were gathering. Folks were coming in from all over the eastern Mediterranean. There was good food. There was good drink. I mean, life was hard for most people. But this was was really that one time every year where it was just a party. And sometimes we, we don't need much more than that in order to be happy. Amen? Be with family, be with friends. It's a great celebration. 
It reminds me of that uh, poem by Carl Sandburg entitled Happiness. I asked the professors who teach the meaning of life to tell me, what is happiness? And I went to famous executives who bossed the work of thousands of men, and they all shook their heads and gave me a smile as though I was trying to fool with them. And then one Sunday afternoon, I wandered out along the Des Plaines River, and I saw a crowd of Hungarians under the trees with their women and children in a keg of beer and an accordion. <laughs> I mean, you know, sometimes it just doesn't take much to make us happy. And so maybe what's going on here is, you know, people are just happy with the party and the celebration and family and friends and all those good things. But Mark wants us to dig a little deeper than that. And he does that by intentionally recounting what it was the crowd was calling out. Hosanna, blessed is the name, or blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. And when we focus on that, what we can see is, yes, the people were happy, but they were something more than that. They were joyful. And in the Bible, joy is related to happiness, but it's intensified a little bit because joy is what we experience. It's a kind of happiness that comes to us when we believe that God is on the move in our lives or in the world. So when we have a sense that we are either seeing or experiencing or we are about to see or experience God's presence, God's activity, the movement of God's future into our reality, that gives us joy. And that's a form, it's an intensification, it's a particular kind of happiness. And so the crowd is calling out Hosanna, which means something like, praise God, praise the Lord. And they're calling down a blessing on Jesus as the one who comes in the name of the Lord. And that's a messianic greeting. They believe that he is a messianic figure through whom God is going to act in order to make all things right, restore the fortunes of Israel and all people. And they also call down a blessing on Jesus as the one who is going to restore the kingdom of David. So they believed their hope, their happiness and joy is really rooted in a conviction that maybe, just maybe, after all these years, the time has come for God to act and reestablish an earthly kingdom, a political and a military entity that could cast the hated Romans out and reestablish God's people independence and give to them a fullness of life. That's what they were calling out to Jesus. That was the source of their hope and their joy. And it's here we come to the central irony of Palm Sunday. And that is, that's not what Jesus had come to Jerusalem in order to to accomplish. Uh, Jesus had come to Jerusalem to suffer and die. He'd been very clear about that. He told the disciples, even as he was being carried along by this crowd, he knew that he wasn't going to fulfill their expectations, but rather he had a different purpose, a different role. And so he allowed the the great celebration to take place, even though he knew there was great misunderstanding. And this, by the way, friends, is how we can understand why the crowd becomes so angry over the next few days. I mean, keep in mind, it's Palm Sunday today, but we're just five days away from Good Friday. And on Good Friday, this same crowd has turned on Jesus, and they want to see him crucified. Why? Because they're angry because he didn't fulfill their expectations. They were so joyful. They were so happy. And then it all came to nothing. What about us, though? You know, it's 2,000 years later, and, and we're gathering here in, in worship, and, and we're hearing about this. We're reading about it. We're, we're calling out Hosanna. I heard you say it earlier, really rather enthusiastically. We're calling out Hosanna. We're, we're celebrating and affirming Jesus as the Messiah. How, how can we do that? Why aren't we disappointed? Why isn't our happiness and our joy ultimately frustrated? To the contrary, it's actually amplified today. And, and the simplest answer I have for you is, well, it's because we celebrate Palm Sunday on the other side of the crucifixion and the resurrection of Jesus. We are going to see this week, and then culminating on Easter Sunday, 
that the plan of Jesus in going to Jerusalem was not to reestablish an earthly kingdom of political and military might to by force establish a new reality of God's presence on earth. No. Jesus came to confront death and sin on the cross and ultimately rise victorious. His goal is to rule in your heart and in my heart so that through us something like the reign of God can break out ever and increasingly in the world around us. That through his resurrection, you and I can come to know the power of forgiveness, that we can stand in the presence of God, not based on our works, but on grace and in love. That yes, one day God will make the world right, but until that time, you and I are called to follow this Jesus, and in following him, even though it's going to cost us from time to time, even though it's not always easy, but to build something of the love and the justice of Jesus Christ in this broken and hurting world. To shine something of God's glory and love into the world around us through what we say and what we do. It doesn't mean that life is going to be devoid of suffering or hardship. We're still going to experience those things, but the power of the gospel is making sure we understand that God can even work through those ugly things, hard things, to do something beautiful in our lives. You see, the gospel is why you and I can gather this day and we are joyful and we are happy. And it's a different reality for us because we understand how it is Jesus has come to establish his kingdom on earth through us and in us. Now, the joy and the happiness of the gospel is expressed in many different places in the New Testament, but As I was thinking about it this week, I thought I'd close with a particular passage of Scripture which has meant a lot to me over the years. It's from 1 Peter, the third chapter. And here, uh, the author is reflecting on why it is you and I can be joyful and happy in the gospel of Jesus Christ because of the difference that it makes in our lives now and into eternity. And... I thought it might be good for us just to close with this today. If you feel comfortable to read along with me, because this is a beautiful passage which just sums up the source of our happiness and joy, what can never be taken away from us. Join with me. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. By his great mercy, he has given us a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who are being protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, even if now for a little while you have had to suffer various trials so that the genuineness of your faith, being more precious than gold, that though perishable, is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Although you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and rejoice with an indescribable and glorious joy, for you are receiving the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Amen. We invite you to get to know our community better. You can do that by exploring our YouTube channel, and do hit subscribe and check notifications so we can send you any future updates. You can also explore our community of faith at the church website, lopc.org. And we hope you know there's always a place for you here.